Welcome to episode 141 of Beyond the Brick. I'm Joshua Hanlon. And I'm Matthew K. And this episode of Beyond the Brick is brought to you by Brickmania.com. Our featured Brickmania product this week is the Brick Arms Overmolded Weapons that Brickmania sells. So if you haven't seen these weapons before, I definitely would encourage you to check them out. I'll have a link in the description to where you can check these out and buy them. They're really neat uh, weapons, and what overmolded means is that the uh, gunmetal parts are a different color. They actually have the authentic gunmetal look over the the rest of the kind of brown wooden part of the the weapon. So they've got World War II weapons, all sorts of really neat weapons in this overmolded molded style that I definitely encourage you to check out. I'll put a link in the description to these weapons so you can check them out. Now, joining us on the show tonight, we're very happy to have John Langrish with us. He is 26 years old. He is a mechanical designer at a nuclear physics lab. And he is a member of three different lugs in Canada, which I think he'll, he'll tell us a little, about, little bit about later in the show. So it's great to have you with us, John. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's exciting. No problem. And if you want to start off with uh, telling us a little bit about three those three lugs you're in, uh, go, you can take us through each one real quick and kind of where they're located. Right. So, yeah, I joined um, Victlog, which is the Victoria Lugger Users Group. Um, I guess it was back in 2006 when I first moved to Victoria. And then about two and a half years ago, I moved to Vancouver. And then we have Vancouver Lego Club here as well as Abbotsford Lego Club because the area is pretty large. So I kind of go and visit both those clubs back and forth, but I guess I'm still sort of like predominantly the Viclog member. Um, but it's kind of fun to bounce around all three. Okay. Is one... mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of varieties. Is one of those larger, significantly larger than the other ones? Yeah, yeah, the, VL, the VLC is the big one because Van Vancouver metro area is kind of the, the hub of population, so it's going to have the largest membership. Gotcha. And is there, I imagine, between all three of those, do you try to make it to several of the shows they do, or how do you do that with uh, shows and conventions? Um, I've sort of been tapering off, unfortunately, with the Victoria one, just because it's a pretty expensive ferry in the way. Um, but, like, VLC, I haven't really done any shows with these. They tend to do, like, museum displays and that sort of thing, whereas Viclug does a lot of, like, one-day toy shows and gaming conventions and things like that. Um, Abbotsford is a pretty new club, so they're just sort of beginning to get into shows. They did a train show this year, which I guess went pretty well. Um, I, I couldn't make it to that one, but next year, hopefully. Uh, and now maybe kind of this is also up. worth mentioning. Uh, you are in the Pacific Northwest, which is a very Lego-centric region, I might say. Uh, have you had any interactions with Sealug? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Sealug guys are great. I know them all from BrickCon. Um, I go down there and visit them sometimes. Uh, I'd, I'd say Sealug is, uh, to me at least, one of the kind of greatest clubs around because it's a high density of awesome air for wells in one place. Um, yeah, they're all great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great way to describe Sea Lug yeah. for sure. Kind of a definitely a high density of great builders there. So it's it's always great when you can hang out with them or uh, do do a show with with them. Yeah, they're just like a phenomenal number of phenomenal builders all in one place. It's crazy, right? Whereas most clubs have like you know some collectors, a few builders, et cetera, et cetera. They're just like all high intensity awesome builders. So it's like Ridiculous. pretty intimidating, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Now, what's some of your, your personal history with Lego building? Did you build with that as a kid, or was it something you got into as an adult? Yeah, so I guess I was probably about, like, three years old when I guess my stocking got, like, a little basic set, maybe about this big, you know, with, like, 50 or 60, like, basic elements. And I think it made a little boat or something. I think it was a blue package. Like, I guess they called it Lego Basic back then. And then shortly after that, I guess I liked it, and I got my mom's. I think it was an old camera box, actually, about, like, maybe this big, full of, you know, the old, like, waffle plate, two by plates and stuff. I started building that, and I guess I never really stopped. So I've never had a dark age. I guess you would call it a, a dim age at one point. Maybe when I was, like, 13 or so, I kind of stopped buying and, like, making my own models so much, but I still have displays made up. of. I remember, like, making a big, like, the rescue theme, a big, like, display of all the sets laid out and stuff like that. And then it was sort of with Lego Star Wars came out and the big Star Destroyer set. And I sort of was like, well, I have to have that Star Destroyer set because that's awesome. Went out, bought that set, kind of off shop at home when it first came out and then from that I found FBTV which is from Bricks to Bothins online and sort of was like hey there's like other people who aren't children and I was probably like 14 at the time, 13 at the time saying other people who aren't children into this and that's kind of what got me into the community and I guess I've never really left since then so I think dim age is a pretty correct term for that awesome yeah. mm -hmm. 
So you found FBTV pretty much first. Was there then like Flickr or uh, was another building site? Where uh, people Flickr, Flickr didn't exist back then. No, that okay, was this was Flickr. before Flickr. And that was brick shelf days for sure. Um, that's when like Lugnet was still going pretty strong. Um, yeah, FBTV was sort of like I guess the gateway drug for a lot of people because Star Wars was always a big thing, and a lot of people were Star Wars fans. Like you know myself, I was like a teenage, like young teenage kid. Star Wars is awesome. So it's kind of like the gateway drug that then you discover, kind of rediscover Lego through that. And I was already very. I think that's a very, very. That's a commonly shared sentiment, right? Yeah, yeah. A a lot of if wells will say that Star Wars is what really kind of got them into it. Um, Totally. So after Mm -hmm. being at FBT, we finally I kind of got into Castle a bit, and that's when Classic Castle formed, and I was immediately on Classic Castle, and then, like you know, Lugnet began to kind of dissolve and all that, and now we guess we have the community as we know it. Um, And then Flickr came along. Now, what was the the transi- transi- uh, is transition like for you from uh, uh, like Lugnet to Flickr, and was, was that or or some of those other photo sharing sites th- through the years there? Was that a fairly smooth transition for you, or did you find that was a really big deal when you had to kind of move from one site to another? Yeah, um, I was never really that big into Lugnet because it was sort of at the end tapering off when I was when I sort of joined, so I never really posted a lot on there. So I guess I was always sort of used to the forum style of FBTV. I mean, back then it was, I guess it was called EasyBoard, was the name of the website software. It was like a terrible old forum software. Oh so as far as the forum side of things, it wasn't that big of a deal. The photo sharing, um, I wasn't really huge on. I think it was maybe a year and a half after kind of the community adopted Flickr that, I think it was Gary McIntyre at, I think, I want to say it was like BrickCon 06 or something, was like, hey, you like have to get on Flickr, you can add like, notes and things. And, and, and then I sort of tried it out, uploaded all my BrickCon pictures, and then I guess that was, like, what happened there. That was, that was pretty good. Um, there was kind of an intermediate step with uh, mock pages, if you're familiar with that. It took the back-end hosting of BrickShelf, and you could then overlay kind of like a um, like comments and description of pictures and stuff like that. People could rate your mocks on, like, a kind of a prettier front-end. And then do you remember the, the, the summer that BrickShelf broke? Yes, yes. Somewhere I probably still have all my favorite builders' galleries downloaded in like. A I know, yeah, yeah. I, I remember doing very similar things. Yeah, yeah you know, like, all, all, the, all the, the great and epic builders, all the inspirational builders, like downloaded in a folder, right? Yeah, I, I was I like, you know, it was, it was like, someone made like a search crawler you could grab entire bookshelf galleries off of, right? Yeah, I, I felt like the guy that's like looting the you know the foot action store like during the you know hurricane or something, yeah, walking yeah. out with a box of like Nike. Yeah, yeah. And Get all the builders' photos. Come on. Come For on. sure. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. And I remember yeah. there was like sites being set up. Like, okay, so I've got so and so, so that's okay. But can you grab so and so's? Because we don't have that one yet. Yeah. It was <laughs> almost like a agreement. concerted like relief effort to save everything as fast as we could, right? And then the dark forces at power, uh, or whoever is at power, uh, Brickshelf is still in existence to it this is. day. So. And it just sort of unchanged. It seems like some people still put things on there, but it's not. Nothing's ever changed. I do notice it's like the same ten like Polish train builders, and yeah. they're amazing train builders. But I, I do notice that, that there's this, this patterns, you know. Same well, stuff. well, go look at Lugnet. There's the same three people in the yeah, cockpit, which is still posting things there. You know, I think we, um, uh, I'm not going to name drop Abner Finley, but Abner, I think <laughs> no, no, Abner no. still posts a Lugnet. I think he right? might. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know about that. I think Abner. there's one club where still uses it sometimes too to communicate. It's just retro at this point, yeah. you know. It, it's like a, it's like an old tea kettle or something, you know. It's That's just right. cool. So. Yeah. There's there's it's, been like talks of revitalizing it and getting it going again and having like Lugnet 2.0 or something, but I don't know. It's like one talk. of these days. One of yeah. these days. Well, it, it, maybe before Bricklink 2.0 comes out, we'll have Lugnet. Uh, that, that's 2.0. a good race there. Yeah, yeah. We'll, <laughs> uh, fight it out. Fight it out. Right. Now, I think Bricklink might be might be changing sooner than later. Um, I, I do think I, I they seem to have a very large team, uh, you know, at work. So we will have to see what they come up with. At BrickCon this year, I was fortunate to be invited to their roundtable event, um, the, the Thursday before BrickCon, and got to to meet. Um, I guess it was maybe about eight or ten of their employees there and such, and they outlaid a lot of their plans of what what was going to happen and wanted our feedback and stuff. And a lot of it was pretty positive. Um, I, I think because it's now a bit more of a business and there's a bit more pressure on to change things. Um, things might happen. Yeah, do, I, the only thing I worry about, and I don't know if you're, uh, I, I do the occasional buying and selling on BrickLink, yeah. um, just the, the fee structure, you know, because that's like the linchpin of what makes it awesome is that they're not trying to take your arm and your leg. Yeah. 
while you're yeah, selling right. off your There's old... There's no, company. like, 15% eBay fees. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. So, yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Well, I'm, I'm sure that's something that they're not going to advertise changing <laughs> until the, it happens, That's right? the biggest feature. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. We're taking more of your money now. <laughs> yeah, it's better for them to to focus on improving the um, search function or something, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's gonna function so much better. How are yeah. we gonna pay for that better function? Well, uh... that's right. Uh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now you mentioned earlier that you kind of you got into FBTB with the the Star Wars stuff, and then you did some classic castle. Do you see yourself as a certain kind of theme builder, or is it just kind of whatever um. catches your fancy at the time? It's kind of whatever catches my fancy at the time. I mean, I'm definitely a castle builder. Like, I guess people might know me from the couple of big castles I made. I'm quite proud of a couple of those, I guess. Um, so I definitely, like, pigeonhole myself to being a castle builder for a while. My collection is, you know, gray and green and all those usual colors for it. Um, but, like, I think beso- behind me, actually, in the photo, you can see a, a tan modular building I made recently. Um, and I'm actually working on something else right now, which is a lot of technic involved, so I'm... I'm working on that. So I, I like to think I kind of build everything. I'm probably the worst at space, though. Like, I, I don't know. I, the creative, like, greebling and stuff just doesn't work for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that can be tough to do. But I guess uh, maybe some more practice in the future, and, and you'll, you'll yeah, get there. Right. <laughs> yeah, I haven't built a whole lot, a lot in the last couple of years, so I'm hoping to try and get back into it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and who knows where that'll go. Maybe Castle is done with I don't know. That modular um, building you mentioned is pretty cool behind you there. Is that the first time you've tried something like that? Or is um, this kind the of first, a like, serious one I've made. I've, I, a few years ago for a, a Vic Lux show, I made a couple modular buildings that were pretty well received, but I think that was kind of earlier on in the whole stages of, of all the sets, right? And the bar is so high for all the sets now. Um, it, it's pretty hard to build to that level. Um, the, the, one, the one behind me in the photo, I started it probably about a year and a half or two years ago, and just sort of was sitting in a box, and I sort of worked on a little bit. Um, it's got, I guess it's called Medium Dark Flesh or some like funny, bizarre building name like that. So it's Medium yes. Dark Flesh and then Tan with some green highlights. Um, I haven't actually posted it online anywhere. It was finished for the Abbotsford Lug train show, and it's since it's been sitting on my shelf, so I should get some photos of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a really um, neat build. Yeah, you'll have to definitely make sure to, to post photos right. of that sometime on, online. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I know. I, I don't feel a huge attraction to posting the photos of everything I make. Um, I, I, I know. I guess there's a point where it's kind of more fun just like show it at conventions or with your friends or whatever at a club meeting. And I, I'm not that interested in posting things online. I don't have to run out and post it right away and show it off, right? Um, yeah, understandable. Yeah. Very understandable. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, as a lot of people will uh, complain about, is photographing is uh, tough sometimes. It takes a lot of time if you really want to get a, a really good photograph of it. So it can be annoying to spend all that time after you've already spent probably a while doing the build. Well, that's the other really intimidating thing is the bar for that is also like just through the roof on the <laughs> photography. Like, not only do you have like perfect photography with perfect backgrounds, then you like image editing like a background in and some like lens flare and some like whatever you're adding in. And I know nothing of Photoshop. I can hardly even open the program, let alone do anything, right? <laughs> so, like, that, that whole bar just kind of... That, that probably is kind of contributed to me not wanting to post as many photos online. It's just because I don't have the skills to. I pretty much be relying on friends who know those skills. That is totally understandable. It's almost like the, the f- photography is like a vocation onto itself, you know? So you have to be like a master yeah. of both of those. To, to really come across strongly, you know. Well, there's certainly FOLs who are having professional photography and editing done. Um, yes, that yeah. is a fact. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, there's unfortunately there's one fellow in VLC who at at um, meetings will often bring his camera and his lighting setup and stuff and be willing to take photos of mocks right there. Um, that is okay, really that works awesome. well. Yeah, that is yeah. really cool. So I'm, I'm hoping I can line up all the modular buildings like the one behind me with all the sets and have some photos kind of like in situ with all the other sets taken of it. I just have to arrange that and get them all together in a big space. Mm-hmm. I, I would say cool definitely some, do like, that. I... Like some like down, down the sidewalk shots of like eight of them lined up or something would be neat. Totally. I, I want to see that photo, yes. Oh, well, eventually. There you go. <laughs> At some point in the future. Yeah. 
Now, uh, you mentioned that you're you're most probably mostly well known for your castle builds, and yeah. you do have uh, one that I, I wanted to make sure we talked about here that's really neat, and it's your I believe it's Nodding Blay Castle is the name of yes. this. And yeah, the play on words there. Yes, <laughs> great play on words. This is a, a really interesting build, and I'll have links in the description to photos of this build for people who haven't seen it, so you can check it out. Uh, really, really cool design you did here. You've got a lot of round towers combined with kind of the angled walls. And then set into the the water and stuff. Uh, it's it's really interesting. What prompted you to do this build? Um, I mean, I guess it was sort of a offshoot of the the castle before it, which featured the round towers for the first time. I got that inspiration um, from a, a sculpture I actually saw done by Terry Landers at BrickCon, probably like 2005 or something, where she made like a kind of a wavy ghost. All it was was the one by one, or the one by two bricks and the one by one rounds, and it just made like a very gently waving ghost like this sort of clear piece. I thought, hey, you know, you could make a circle out of that. So I went home, and that's where the first one, Stone Guard Hold, came from. And then like, that was kind of built within the the bricks I could, had on on hand then. And then I built that one. And everyone loved it, etc. So I thought, well, I want to build like kind of more what I want to build rather than what was limited by the parts I had. So that's where Notting Blade Castle came from. So it's kind of like Stone Guard Hold, like how it should have been. Um, but really, my focus on that was to get the angles. If you look at the angles of it, I think only two of the walls actually line up with the base plate grid. All the other walls are floating on top of um, sideways bricks and tiles. And then integrating the round towers with those kind of naturally lends itself to the angles. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I, I noticed there. I thought that that was a really cool technique, the way you did that. Uh, the, the angled walls, I know that that's not the easiest way to do it. Obviously, with the shape of Lego bricks, it's easier just to build kind of ang uh, regular like 90-degree angles at everything for your castles, but it, it definitely gives a cooler, different look when you do it this way. Right. Well, well, back then, I mean, castle building, to me, is... Maybe this is going to insult some people, I don't know. Um, it's kind of always lagged behind space building. Like, at the, the time when I built that, maybe in the first castle, I'd say. Space building had all these crazy snot techniques and some, like, motorization happening and all these, like, awesome stuff going on. And castle, for the most part, was still pretty basic base plates with square walls and such put on top of them, right? So the yeah. first thing was, like, landscaping. Landscaping is key. You have to have that. And the second was, well, let's, like, start applying some of these more interesting techniques to castle. So, like, the snot water nowadays is probably no big deal, right? Everyone does, like, snot water. And other people have those crazy, like, one-by-one -one trans bricks stacked yeah, up. Yeah, that seems to be the popular trend yeah, now it's the like last couple years. Yeah, it's, trends, right? But at the time, it was sort of like, wow, there's, like, snot water. That was kind of a big thing, right? And, and then wow. also I wanted to point out, in the, is it in the left corner? Am I seeing some snot trees? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Those, okay, those so that's very 2013 of you. Yeah, well, right, actually, that's, um, you know, the, the Lowell Sphere designed by Bruce Lowell. Well, yeah. that was inspired by him. Mm -hmm. um, because essentially it's the same principle as Lowell's Sphere, except the bottom's taken off and you put a stump in the bottom instead as kind of a continuation yeah. of the core. I've actually got two sizes of those. Um, if you search around Flickr, I think my name and, like, Snot Tree or something, I think someone actually made instructions for those. Um, that is awesome. Someone sent me a Flickr mail and said, hey, I've replicated one, can I make instructions? And, like, of course, yeah, sure, you can go for it. So if you want to build those, you also can. Um... Mm, that's, that's, all, yeah. all the tan pathways are also snot, of course. I think that's actually a neat shot of the courtyard, kind of looking down from over top of the walls. I think that's my favorite shot of the, the model. And you can see how kind of none of the angles line up. And that's only really really achievable by having snot done like that. Totally. Um, so, I mean, careful placement is, of tiles. It, it is totally safe to say that this build is like at least, you know, seven, eight, ten years ahead of its time. Well... Well, thanks for saying that. I mean, it just kind of yeah. was the best I could manage at the time. I mean, it's, it's funny because you, cool. line, you line that up against uh, some like the current castles coming out and like all the model walls and especially the, all the weird snot and slopey terrain and stuff. Like that just blows out of the water, right? Um, it's totally. always advancing. The bar is always going higher. I know. Yeah, you got to climb in to keep up. Maybe, maybe that's one of the reasons I don't want to build another castle because it, it won't measure up, right? Yeah, I know you, you have to come up with something pretty ridiculous now. Well, some of the round tower techniques, right? Like, at the time, that round tower technique was like, wow, that's so cool. Yeah. And now there's so many crazy ones. Like, I think someone saw, I saw it took, like, the you know, sort of the stop sign piece, the little clip on the back of a 2x2 two two tile, that kind yeah. of piece, and put, like, thousands of them around to make an almost truly round and seamless tower going up. 
And then someone did that tapered as well. I think it was actually a tapered tower that came up. Have you seen it? Jordan Schwartz has the Rapunzel's Tower. It was Maybe that's on what the I'm cover of that about. book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, it uses like uh, I'm I'm probably gonna, it's like brackets or something, and then the brackets are flexed. Yeah, and that, that's right. Like, that, I mean, yeah, ridiculous. Techniques. There's ones like that. Like the the, the bar is so high on those techniques. Yeah, it's and also so parts intensive. Yeah. Um, oh like God. at the time, like one by two bricks were in pick a brick, they were pretty easy, and then one by one round bricks were pretty cheap before. Like these are all old gray, right? So before new gray happened, those were pretty cheap, so you could afford to do that. But some of the specialty pieces you need in huge quantities. Like, totally. someone knows someone at Legoland to get those, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially that in is, Jordan's case, maybe. That's the truth. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, I wanted to go back to something you mentioned earlier. I thought that was interesting, your comparison. Uh, you know, this was a few years back now of castle versus kind of space builds where the, the level of detail and stuff. Uh, what would be your theory for why that is? Like, did, did have you thought out why the, the space uh, builds were, were far ahead of the castle builds when you built this? Um... I don't know if there's a, a real reason for that. I mean, maybe it's like a cultural thing of who's building space versus who's building castle or something. I mean, you look at someone like a um, friend, Braun. Um, he, he's like a PhD engineer, like doing space stuff. So of course he's going to be interested in super complicated techniques and such. So maybe there's like a, just like a demographical reason for that. Um, it might also just do with the Lego sets themselves. Like generally look at castle sets. I've never really liked castle sets very much because of all the, the big pre-made wall pieces they have and they're pretty basic builds. Whereas space sets were always a bit more advanced than that as well. So maybe there's a combination of reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, also, it's easy to get pigeonholed into a castle using a very, very basic palette of parts. Whereas space, you can dig through your bin and say like, oh, here's this like crazy bionicle bracket or something. That can be a a rocket booster or whatever you want it to be, right? A laser cannon. Whereas Castle, there's not really that same flexibility. Yeah, you're hitting the nail on the head with that one. It's like Castle, I mean, you're talking about big towers, you know, that requires, like, a lot of something, just a ton of brick. Exactly. But the exactly. spaceship, it's easy to, like, take, like, yeah, like, just one piece, and then it's almost like the the molding of that piece can become, like, an integral part of yeah, the Yeah, that, that's the philosophy of so. how people sort of mock. Like, some yeah. people will see a single piece, like a cockpit, and say, oh, I want to have this shape flow off the cockpit or something. Yeah. Whereas, I, I assume very few, maybe nowadays it's different, but very few castle mocks are like, yes, I have this 2 by 4 brick I can build a mock around it, right? That's not how it works. It's, the curvature is no. speaking to me, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that's not really the same case. <laughs> you got to avoid the, the big gray wall syndrome, I think is what some people call it, uh, with your castle build. Just make sure it's not just one massive... Yeah, see, I've always kind of been a fan lab. of the great big walls. Like, if you look at any of my mocks, they I don't do... I have never done the modeling on the wall, so, I mean, I totally appreciate looking at it, but it's not something I'm really interested in building myself, is is the model walls. But... Definitely. Um, I, I mean, I think there's other ways to break up great big walls, like having windows and things like that in... Um, some blood stains down the walls or something. You, uh, you can get away with some of the the big gray walls if you uh, like. You still have some really great landscape, nice round towers and stuff like that. Then it, it doesn't look as bad as just like four gray walls on, on a castle. So yeah, that that uh, build did turn out very good, by the way. Uh, really, really great job. What was the? You can remember while you're building it. Was there like one part that was the toughest? Was it the round towers or landscaping or anything um, like that? I think it was just meshing the round towers on top of the landscape, especially the courtyard, because I had the snot of the tan pathway that had to perfectly match in squarely with all the landscape, but then tuck underneath all the edges of all the walls. So that's pretty tricky. Um, it's kind of like the way it's built, if you can imagine, that the round towers, all the exterior walls come directly to the center of the circles. And then all the inner walls were stepped off eight studs inside. So when you get to the corner, kind of like inside where a round tower would be sitting out here, there's a huge amount of force in some of the pieces there. So they had a tendency to kind of like explode the wall out or something. It was quite dramatic. <laughs> um, so I think it was kind of like building that and then slipping the landscape and pathway underneath that was pretty difficult. And of course, then it's like, okay, I need a tile here. Okay, that one, I can move the tile one more in and put a stud there. Because I was trying to keep as many studs on the grass as was possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think it turned out really well, so that's that's very cool. Do you have any uh, other big castles planned for the future or any other uh, big projects coming up here? Um, 
castles, no. I actually had a pretty big landscape. I think it was almost 12 gray base plates in size. I had actually about half built, and I'm actually taking it apart now. I smashed it. I didn't like it. Um, so that's probably <laughs> disappointing. Um, and I am working on something else. Um, I, I don't want to say what it is, but it's not a castle, that's for sure. It's very technic-heavy right now. Um, it's definitely crossing over into the mechanical designer realm of my professional life. Um, okay. So I hopefully that'll be done with um, for for BrickCon um, in October, uh, twenty fifteen. But I, I'm not making any promises. It's a collaboration with someone, which is also interesting. So um, ho hopefully I'm making coming. Of, I'll call it coming out of retirement. I'll say. Um, <laughs> I have a brick badge, which is RFOL, which is retired fan of Lego, um, <laughs> since I didn't build for so long. Oh. But um, ho hopefully that'll change. The tides are turning. Hopefully, and like may maybe castles way behind me. Who knows? Mhm. Mm well, it'll be it'll be nice to see uh, another build come out from you. And now you, you you mentioned there a little bit that you you do this mechanical uh, designer work. Has this uh, kind of affected other builds in the past, or is this really the first build where you felt like it's the the two have met and you've kind of meshed the two together? Um. I, I wouldn't say there's that much crossover. I mean, I would say Lego definitely, like, as, as a child, attributed to why I'm a mechanical designer. It definitely went that way for sure. And I've always been a fan of the Technic sets. I probably own all, like, the, you know, the really big flagship sets from maybe, like, the mid-2000s on. I, I always get all those big ones. Um, the Unimog is one of my probably favorite Technic sets ever made. Um, so I've always built those sets, really enjoyed building them, but I've always kind of been almost terrified of building Technic models with them because, like... When I'm designing something like work, I can just like make, have the machine shop cut whatever length of metal I want, make whatever gear I want, etc. Whereas in Lego, you're set to these very finite dimensions. So I've always considered it almost harder to design things in Lego than in real life. Mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of my first like serious, serious building with Technic of my own. I've made like a mechanism for things before. <clears throat> I've had like figures jump up and down. I once made a um. I guess it was like a, a baseball diamond with some stands and the, the figures would kind of do the wave as they went along and stuff like that. But it was like pretty minor little functions. So this is, this is going to be a pretty this, major this project coming it, up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is like, like mind storms and stuff involved too, hopefully. So. Very nice. Well, that sounds awesome. So we'll, we'll definitely be look, looking forward to that one then. Yeah, I'm having to kind of reorganize my stuff because it was all my collections built for making castles, right? So it's all like giant tubs of one by two bricks and such. Now all of a sudden it's like, well, I need to find all my like axles of a certain length or whatever. So I've had to resort a bunch of that and take some of my big sets apart because all those sets are uh, all those sets are made up actually. You know how hard it is to take apart Technic sets. I'm sure it's like hard, longer to take them apart than to build them. Yes, because then you had like sandwich joints and pins. Yeah, and pins. you have these things where you can like put the axle in and put the pin in or something and it locks everything in place. But you have no way to pull that back out. It's very difficult. So yeah. And that's one of the uh, tribulations of building is I have to take all my stuff apart. It's hard <laughs> on the fingers. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, that is true about the Technic. I never really thought about that much, but uh, as you get all those pins and everything in there, taking apart Technic builds is definitely a lot it's, tougher it's than taking hard, apart yeah. Builds. Yeah. They, they don't really make a brick separator for Technic, right? They have, like, I guess the new one has the pin on the back side of it. Yes, it does so. have the pin. Yeah, you kind of push it out. It's pretty limited use, though, because you have the pin and then you have the big, like, handle sticking up beside it, right? Yeah, you can't really get it in anywhere that matters. One of the yeah. tricks is if you get the longest axle, like, say, like, a 12-long axle and stack a bunch of 2 by 2 round bricks on top and then, like, a boat bottom on the bottom of it, it kind of makes a good pusher that goes in the palm of your hand without killing it. Huh. <laughs> That is an interesting thought. That is actually pretty nifty, yeah. It's not my idea. I stole it from someone else. No no credit to me, but no idea who it was. Thank you for disseminating it. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe somebody can try that out now, and it'll save their hand yeah, a little. Yeah, all your listeners will have functioning <laughs> fingers tomorrow, right? <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned uh, earlier that you've you've made it to BrickCon a few years. I'm assuming you'll uh, continue to make it there again next year. Are there any other conventions you're going to make it to over the next year, do you think? Um, well, yeah, I was going to say, actually, that this BrickCon in 2014 was actually my fifth, or so my tenth BrickCon to go to. So my first was 05, and it was actually my 15th convention total. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I've also visited Bricks by the Bay for the first two years of it, and BrickFest PDX when that was happening, and more recently Bricks Cascade. So I'm hoping to make it back down to Brooks Cascade this year. And um, I'm not sure about the other ones. We'll have to see what happens. And BrickCon is so easy, and I also 
I'm a big VidCon fan. I think it's the best convention I've been to. So, <laughs> pretty much everyone. Like, I mean, all conventions are great. I mean, you're gonna meet Air Force, it's gonna be great. But everyone who goes to VidCon pretty much says it's the best one. Yeah, so I, guys this is out. a commonly shared sentiment. Yes, we we yes. intend to, We need to get out there. That's we, right. We need to get out there. Um, so, so this is actually a, a good moment to mention to to all your listeners that if anyone is interested in visiting Vancouver, BC in spring 2016, we are planning the first. West Coast Canadian Lego Convention. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, so a bit of a shout out right there for that. Um, so that's a, a year and a half away. So it's a lot of time to plan. That, that is a, that is a very nice window, though. You'll, we will have a very good event planned out by that time. So, so we're looking at late April or early May as a, a hopeful date for that. Um, I don't want to say too many details. We're still in the very early planning phases of that, but it's something that I want to get in people's minds that you're going to be in Vancouver in spring 2016. And you're, you're going to fly to Seattle, and then you're going to drive across the border to save money on those international airfare, yeah. Some people probably, yes. Yes, yes. So is this one of the Brick Fet events, or is this something else entirely? No, this will be something we're, we're doing ourselves. Um, okay. There's a few FOLs in the area who are interested, plus we have the three clubs here to support us doing it, so that's a pretty totally. good community here. And then you got um, Seattle just down the road? Yep, BrickCon is, is fully supportive of it as well. That's um, awesome. That is really cool. It'll kind of be the opposite side of the year because BrickCon is October and then we're looking at later spring, so it'll kind of be like caps to the summer ones, kind of the beginning ones, kind of the end. Totally. So. Mm-hmm. It's, it's always great cool? to hear about a new Lego show popping up, so that'll that'll be really cool. It, it is, but there's also the risk of like a over overabundance of them. Like there's conventions I'd never even heard of before happening in the states. Like. There's you, a new convention I don't think it, every week. Exactly. It seems like it is in the summer. It's like, oh, I'm going here, I'm going here, I'm going here. And I kind of wonder at what risk do you risk kind of fragmenting? Like, yeah, I think that there's, we definitely entered into a time period where the demand from, like, the public is, like, greater than the yes. amount of AFOLs there are to satisfy that demand, you know? Well, so. it, like, it's definitely sort of before, you know, there was BrickFest, and, well, at the time it was called Northwest BrickCon, and, and a few ones like that. So it's sort of like, okay, well, if you're going to go to a convention in the spring, it's going to be this one. And mm-hmm. now you kind of have to check with your friends being like, well, are you going to be at this one? I really want to see you. Or should we go to this one instead? And at what point does it begin to kind of like fragment that way? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's no longer like, uh, what, I guess Brick Fair or Brick Fest and then Brick World and Brick Con. That was it. That's right. Yeah, that, that was mo- mostly it. That's right. Yeah, and now we, there's like 30, 40. It, it was interesting. Know. I went to Brick's Cascade for the first time. That's in Portland, Oregon, mm-hmm. in the same site as Brick Fest PDX used to be. And it was almost an entirely new crowd of people, which I didn't really expect because I'd been to Brick Fest there before, like three or four or five years ago. And I mean, sure, there was a few Seattle people went there. Paul Hetherington and I came down from Vancouver. But in general, it was a whole host of new Air Foils I'd never met before. So that was really neat. But it's sort of like this whole like of community of convention attendees who we've never met before, which is kind of neat. It's, it's good. Yeah. It's like there's a new guard or something exactly, like that. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So as, as long as there's communities like that to support the conventions, I guess it's a good, a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's also, you've got to consider, you know, when, the, when it was only BrickCon, BrickFair, and BrickWorld, think of all the, the people that didn't have a convention within, you know, driving distance or That's really right. within distance at all, and now as you have all these pop up at different places, there's a lot more people that can finally make it to convention and display their builds and stuff, which uh, obviously a lot of people get excited for. Yeah, and I mean, the community is massively growing as well. Like, you look at how big... We were actually talking about it, I think, on, on last Friday we had a joint Abbey Lug and VLC meeting. I think it came up that VLC started out being like eight members or something, right? And now we have, we have maybe like 40 people at that meeting. And as far as registered members, there's maybe 80 or something. Like, it just exploded, right? Yeah, it's the story of every month. Yeah, in 2005, when I first went to to BrickCon, I think it was 76 attendees or or 80 attendees. Mm -hmm. And now they're about 500. And now conventions are having to... Like, I think BrickWorld has to actually put a cap on the registrations at some point, if I'm correct. Totally. Um, yeah, I, th- I think they, yeah, it's something like a thousand, thousand registrants or something like something that. Something like that, yeah, that they actually limited and people can't get it anymore, which is a crazy thing, whereas, like, it shows you how much it's expanding. So I guess, I guess as demand grows, supply of conventions can also grow. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, 
Uh, it will be interesting to see where, where it goes from here with uh, more and more conventions and shows popping up. Mm-hmm. But it never hurts to have another one in Canada, I'm sure. So we will be looking forward to, to that show in early 2016, you said? Uh, later spring. We're, we're hoping like okay. end of April, early May, sometime in that time um, is what we're, what we're going for. Because Vancouver is a great place to visit. So we're hoping we can, we can attract people to Vancouver for Vancouver as well as for the LEGO event. <laughs> it's kind of a cool thing. Good. Yeah. Now, I think to uh, finish it out for us tonight, do you have a, a dream LEGO set that you've always wanted LEGO to make or one you, you really wish they would make at some point? Um, I, I've always been a car fan. So there's been sets like the Ferrari line of sets, and there's obviously the, the Mini Cooper and the Volkswagen Beetle and those sets. But I've always wished that there was a theme, not like a brand-specific theme, but just like a theme of like supercars or classic cars or something, which are done in, in a, like an Ultimate Collector Series type thing, like a, like a large model three or four thousand pieces of, of various famous cars. I think that would be awesome. Um, mm-hmm. I guess that would be the ultimate one. <laughs> get some, some cool popular cars out there. I'm sure that could be that, that could go over really well. I know. Yeah, like if I could have like like a McLaren P one four thousand piece set. It doesn't matter how much it costs. I'm gonna buy that thing, right? Let's be honest. I think yeah. that this is this like leads into the larger question of like why isn't Lego ideas like they doing some higher price point sets, you know? Like the Lego Direct sets that were coming right. out, uh, you know, early on. Like, uh, why not, you know, throw like a crazy set just on the market? It'll probably well, sell. I guess there's rumors of this helicarrier coming out. Huh. Um, I have no official knowledge of that, but I'm assuming you guys have heard the rumors about that as well. Yes, I have. Yeah, I heard that because I think it made like a tiny appearance in one of the the designer videos talking yeah, about. Yeah, there was some the... like leak about it. Yeah, and then then one of the, the I think it was the big letters of like Lego designer or whatever. Yeah, it, yeah, letters, yeah, it was been... like a. Uh, like uh, what do you call it, the Quinjet or whatever that thing's called? Mm-hmm. Um, the, the ship from the Avengers. A little like a micro-scale one in one of them or something like that. Um, but anyway, I mean, that was an ideas project of some like crazy huge model they could never make. It was like 10,000 pieces or something. So I, I'm not sure. Maybe that will be an idea set, or maybe they will have like stolen the idea and made a, um, a UCS Avenger set out of it. Who knows? But... Uh... That's what Lego Ideas was designed for them to just uh, steal people's ideas, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> I mean it, it depends how you want to think about how you phrase it, right? Because at the end, they're not going to make something they're not going to make money off of. So yeah. They're going to totally. do well one way or another, whether it's <laughs> stealing it. I mean, I assume when you submit something, you give up. So, right, what is it? It's a 1% royalty or something like that that they give, right? Uh, yeah, you, I don't know what the number yeah. is, but there's something like I think that. It's, I think that's what it is, yeah. Which isn't that bad, considering how many of some of the sets are selling. Oh yeah, it's not. No, like, no, it's, it's, I mean, it's not something to laugh at. Not, and uh, not at all. Yeah, not in the slightest. Yeah, I mean, uh, twenty thousand units. You know, at, what thirty-five dollars a piece? I don't know. Do the math. That's yeah. uh, not too shabby. Yeah, see, I'm not really that huge on pop culture, so things like the DeLorean and Ghostbusters didn't excite me that much. But the bird set, I'm very stoked for the bird set. Yes, I, I, I definitely. I think awesome. this is something I reiterate all, very often. Uh, the just uh, having the non-licensed, uh, you know, no IP based. Uh, yeah, like the Exo Suit was obviously the exactly. The, the, a good yeah, the one Research there. Institute. Like that's just awesome. That you know, it's yeah. just a bunch of it's, it's just a pure fan creation. Right, and it's, I guess there's a potential for the Big Bang Theory, and then the um, the Doctor Who is not out the window yet. I, I like Doctor Who. That's one thing I do like. So yes. I, I would be stoked to see that, depending on how it was done. But it's the bird set I'm really excited for. Well, I, I think, that, sorry, sorry. I was going to say, I think the bird set, it's almost like what LEGO creator sets could be if the designers were allowed to do whatever they wanted. Because yes. look at the creator sets. There's like, some of them are really awesome, like the, um, the, the cat one, and then there's the parrot one coming out. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're awesome models, but they're not quite to that like, professional level. Whereas that bird set is like just the next little push to being like, very it's like if, if they could flesh it out a little bit more, exactly. they would. But they exactly. Yeah. So I think I think that bird set is what creator sets could be. So I, I am very exciting. excited for that bird set to hit yeah. store shelves. That that really yeah, brought a smile to my face when I saw the announcement. It, uh, to be honest, I didn't expect it would become a set. I was no. surprised. Yeah, exactly. I'd, I'd actually I'm um, just flowing down to California to designer con that that weekend, and I, I flew it in the morning, and I got to our, my friend Remy's house, Remy and Elise, two, two or four walls down there, got to their house, and, and Remy had to do some work or something, he was looking on my phone at like what the newest LEGO news was and stuff, and I'm like, they're making the bird set, and he couldn't believe it either, we were both so excited about that. 
and that was kind of the bottom of the pile of what we expected would go through because it wasn't a traditional idea set or even a traditional Lego set. So I think a lot of people were surprised by that. Totally, but, yeah. Out of left field, but, you know, good nonetheless. Yeah. Now, but, um... John, this is something I wanted to throw in. Uh, just you know, I don't know if this is uh, maybe not uh, the best. Like, I just wanted to bring it up. So you're in Vancouver, right? And there's a guy named Robin there, right? Robin Sand. Robin Sather. Yes. Yes. And, and so from time to time, I do see on your photo stream photos of you pop up with uh, you know various builds that he does. Uh, maybe right. talk just a little bit uh, about uh, w what you do with him. From time yeah, for time. sure. I, I almost brought those up when I was talking about like myself not building and such, because I guess most of my building's kind of recently been done with Robin. So Robin's a, an LCP, so a Lego certified professional. So that means he can use the Lego brand name and has some support with Lego um, to, to do it as a full time job. So he travels around Canada doing traditionally these Duplo builds. So it's usually done like in a mall setting or some sort of promotional event. And he builds a Duplo large-scale model of something. Like we did a Chinatown arch in Victoria. We've done a, a ferry, um, a big lighthouse, things like that. So generally, he's the mastermind. So he's got the designs in his head. Generally, it's photos with scales on them of how large in like Duplo studs it'll be. And I'm fortunate that often I get to go help out building those. So it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. Um, so what is the? It, it, and I think that he might have a niche in that respect that no one else really does. Uh, large-scale Duplo builds. Yeah, the Duplo uh, makes it a bit unique. Like, Lego, of course, does the store opening builds and those, like, large two-refer brick constructions that they yeah. do. But as far as Duplo, um, I, I know of a couple other Air Force doing, like, the one, one or two um, builds like that. But as, mm -hmm. as a job, I, I think he's pretty unique right now. Definitely, definitely. It's a lot of fun to build with Duplo, actually. It's, it's a funny thing because you think about it, it's actually the same sculpting as you'd be doing with regular bricks. It just you get a result which is twice as big in every dimension, right? So yes. it ends up being like eight times the volume, but you can still build it in a weekend. Yeah, like we can yeah, build yeah, an eight-foot-long right. ferry in three days, whereas we could do the exact same ferry and system, but it would take eight times as long. It would be like a month-long event. Putting together like a exponentially more pieces, yeah, to get the same. Yeah, so, so it's a lot of fun. Um, Robin's really good about engaging... The club, especially Viclog. Viclog is very active with his builds he does in Victoria. He's got a couple standing arrangements with a, a local mall and then the town of Sydney, which is kind of like a, a area just north of, of Victoria. And every year, it's kind of like a standing thing where, where we build a large model with him. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, and he yeah. does seem to involve uh, uh, the fans uh, a lot more than other LCPs. Well, I mean... Robin's a longtime Lego fan. I mean, totally. he, he sort of helped invent the LCP program, mm -hmm. and and he was a Lego fan long before any professional stuff going on. So, That's yeah, awesome. he's a he's a great guy. He's also involved with the um the Canadian convention as well. He's ah sort of uh, yes yes. So he, will he be doing one of those like large scale builds? You think during the um I don't know about that actually. That seems likely. Depends how busy we are organizing the event. Right? You got to do it. You got to do it. Time. He did have a big orca. We made a killer whale in Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. I guess it was about June when we built that, and Robin made a replica of it that could be transported, and at BrickCon he had that set up, which was quite neat. Very and I cool. think about two years previous he made a, a, a Tory arch and built that on site. I believe it was built on site at BrickCon as well. So it's definitely a possibility. That was the, the uh, big in Japan, or what was the theme? For yeah, the that, that's right. It was big in Japan. Big in Japan, okay. I remember it's, seeing it. Kind of like yeah. I think it's the Brothers Brick theme or something like that. Yeah. The Bricks of Character, Brothers Brick. One, one of those groups ha oh. had that theme that year. So there's also Japanese stuff. Totally. It's pretty neat. It, it is awesome with the Duplo Bills because it's just such a, a colossal object. Like I don't know if you can put a link in the description or not, but there's a um, the, the Chinatown Arch in Victoria that we made. It's probably the most impressive one I've been involved with. And that was actually a lot of system bricks mixed in. I'm, I'm assume most AFOLs know it, but a lot of people from the public don't know that. A 2x4 brick fits on top of yeah. two Duplo studs, right? Yeah. So, for example, for the, the details on the Chinese Arch, we could make mosaics out of normal system bricks and plates and then snap them into the Duplo. So we get this very, very like, elaborate detail that from a distance doesn't even look like Lego, mixed in with this giant, like, eight-foot-tall or whatever it was arch. Like so the best awesome. of every world. Exactly. Now, is that, is that the build that I think I was looking through your, your Flickr earlier, and is that the build where it's got, like, a, a photo of you sitting in front of it? 
That's right. That would be okay, the one. Okay. Okay. So I know what you mean. Yeah. That that was a really really cool build. I know what you're talking about there. That yeah. was cool the way that they did that. Yeah. That that was a lot of parts in that one. That was a huge huge build. And that one actually we were a bit optimistic. It was supposed to take about three days. It took closer to five. Um, <laughs> but but the result was awesome. So that's that's worth it. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. And like you said, you know, Duplo is certainly not something that a lot of adult builders uh, use on a daily basis by any means. So it's interesting to, to hear about some of the, the techniques and some of the ways that's used by even like Lego certified professionals and people yeah, like that. I think some people will use Duplo inside a build. Like, for example, if you build mm-hmm. a castle inside the landscape, but it's having the Duplo as the exposed final product isn't a very common common thing, I don't think. Yeah, that's definitely true. That's- so. Yeah, that's really cool. It's it's nice that you're able to to do some work with him and uh, and experience some of that yourself. Yeah, a lot of fun. I recommend to anyone to just start playing around with the Duplo. It's amazing how with simple parts you can get like really like good characters, and you have to really choose the features you make prominent. But you can make some pretty expressive mocks with it. Um, oh yeah. I encourage everyone to to go go to their like niece or nephew or daughter or whoever has a bunch of Duplo in their in their family and start playing with it. Experiment with uh, with exactly. some some different styles of building. Yeah, sounds good. Well, with that uh, with that great building tip, I think that will wrap it up for right. us tonight. Uh, it was it was great having you on the show, John. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us and uh, learning about some of your builds and some of what you've done in the community over the years. Well, yeah, thanks for having me. It was a it was a good time. I really had no idea what to expect, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we're right. glad it, it was. Well, I uh, hope I didn't put everyone to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, I think I think everyone enjoyed it. So, uh, actually, I actually think uh, Robin might have been uh, watching some of the the live. I think he was. Well, he so. was texting me just moments or something. He posted on Facebook when he was starting. I think just before we did. So. <laughs> okay. I, I, I spammed it around to all the clubs and on my Facebook awesome. trying to get everyone to watch. So. Very so. cool. Sounds good. And I'll make sure to include a link to your Flickr page and all the builds we talked about in awesome. the description of this video so people can check all those out and uh, make sure you follow John on Flickr and keep updated with all the builds he'll be releasing here hopefully soon in the future. <laughs> and uh, just a reminder about the, the Brick Builders Club. I'd encourage you to check that out at brickbuildersclub.com. You can start receiving your monthly box of uh, really cool Lego content like stickers, custom pieces, all sorts of cool stuff. That's brickbuildersclub.com. I'll have a link to that in the description as well. And if you aren't subscribed already to the YouTube page, I'd encourage you to subscribe here at Beyond the Brick to keep up to date with all of our latest videos and all the the interviews we're putting out here. Uh, We'll be taking a break over Christmas here for a couple weeks, but uh, right after about the beginning of the new year, we'll be right back with uh, weekly episodes for you. Uh, So you definitely look forward to that. Thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, We'll see you soon.